Welcome everyone this morning here in the name of the Lord as today we're going to hear that famous parable that Jesus told, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And we're going to answer the question, the righteousness that God requires. Is that something we have to go and get? Or is that something that God actually gives to us? And that's going to be the focus then of our sermon here this day. So invite the congregation in to please stand as we're going to follow the order of Matthews. And we'll begin there on page 219. Oh Lord, open my lips.
Pentecost. Let's take it from the book of Genesis, the fourth chapter. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our epistle reading then is taken from Paul's second letter to Timothy, the fourth chapter. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserve May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. By the congregation, we stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel, then, according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter in this reading, will form the basis of our sermon, then, here this morning. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. For the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it.
Everyone looks up to him, and if you ask anyone, they'll tell you he's a genuinely good guy. He's so good, in fact, that last week he was joking with some of the other guys in the congregation as they walked out of church, and he said, Poor, miserable sinner? Ha! I'm definitely not poor. Everyone knows that. And I've never been miserable in my entire life. And sinner, well, I'm about as good as they get. Now, on the other hand, there's another man who always comes to church, but no one really cares for him. Everyone knows he's not the type of person to associate with. Everyone is sure that he's up to no good. He's been a troublemaker all his life, just like his father before him. Oh sure, he graduated from high school, but everyone's sure he probably doesn't even give a single cent to the church, much less to charities. He mostly comes to church and doesn't really talk to anyone. He sits off in the back. He doesn't even wait around at the end of church to shake the pastor's hand. In fact, as the first guy was joking last week, he pointed at that second guy as he drove off, and he said, now that guy, he's the model of a poor, miserable sinner right there. And everyone laughed, not thinking anything of it. I mean, no one even likes that guy anyways. Why does he even come to church? No one actually knows that guy. No one has taken the time to get to know him since he came back to town a few years ago. No one knows that he grew up in a terrible home and that he couldn't wait to get out of here. So when he was 18, he went down there to that office and he signed up for the Marines. He did two tours, tours of duty in the Middle East and one tour in Africa somewhere that no one talks about. And still, still he has issues with what he's done. He came back to town because the pastor was the only person in his life who was ever nice to him. He sees the pastor at least once a week, most of the time for private confession and absolution. He knows full well that he's a poor, miserable sinner. And he's beginning to understand that only Jesus Christ can truly understand his struggles. Only Jesus Christ can give him the forgiveness he so desperately needs. He really doesn't like to be around a lot of people because now it makes him feel uncomfortable. That's why he doesn't stick around after church. Now, understand that this is just a scenario that I've made up to help us understand today's parable. No likeness do I know of that's exactly like this, and I'm not trying to tell you don't be on any boards of nonprofits. It's not that's not the, the parable here. Um, but the Pharisees seemed to be some of the most upstanding people in their com community. Not only did they keep the law of Moses, but they also made up extra laws so that they could keep those as well and prove just how righteous they themselves were. For instance, one day a year was called to be a fast. That is the great day of atonement. But the stricter Pharisees 
voluntarily fasted twice a week. They decided that because Monday and Thursday was probably when Moses went up Mount Sinai and came down Mount Sinai, those would be the days they fasted. The Pharisees not only tithed the normal 10% of their wage, but they even tithed every little thing, even their herbs, counting out their mint and counting out their mustard seeds. The Pharisee, when he came into the temple, he took the place of honor, of prominence. He stood up, praying aloud about himself, almost in a congratulatory manner. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even that tax collector. I fast twice a week, twice a week, everybody. I give tithes of all that I get. The Pharisee was one of those who trusted in himself that he was righteous and treated everyone else with contempt. Now, on the other hand, there was the tax collector. Now, I don't know if you know this, but in the ancient world, tax collectors were despised by everyone. The Jews hated them because they worked for the Romans and were known to charge more than the required taxes and pocket the extra for themselves. The Romans hated them because they were Jews and not Romans, and they were seen as a necessary nuisance. They were generally seen as dishonest, traitorous, and terrible sinners. But in our parable, it says, the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here is a perfect model of one who knew himself to be a poor, miserable sinner and that only Jesus Christ could save him from his wretched state. In the parable, it's easy to see how the Pharisee was, went wrong and all the places that he went wrong how he exalted himself, and how the tax collector humbled himself before God. We look at this example and we think to ourselves, oh yes, we are just like the tax collector. I mean, we confess our sins before God in heaven. I mean, everyone here can see how we confess our sins and just how pious we really are. Which, it makes me wonder, how often are we actually more like this Pharisee? Which of you can actually say you weren't thanking God you were nothing like the Pharisee or nothing like that upstanding gentleman from the beginning of the sermon? Much less like the tax collector or the troublemaker from the beginning. It's our nature to compare ourselves to others and exalt ourselves because we're not as bad as the other guy. As we've talked about for the last four weeks, we're afraid of so many things, including being exposed before others as sinners. But remember what Jesus said, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, 
but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Did you hear that? Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. But you see, therein lies the problem. We can't do it. Try as we might, we can't humble ourselves. Try as we might, we want to make ourselves righteous before others. If I can put that guy down, I'm going to look righteous. We can't do it. And so Jesus had to do it for us. Though he is God, exalted above, above all from eternity, he humbled himself and was made man, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect life under the law, the law that the Pharisees so tried so hard to live perfectly, and they couldn't. But Jesus fulfilled that law perfectly. And humbling himself even further, he took upon himself our sins. And he suffered and was hung on a cross for you, for your sins, and for the sins of the whole world. To justify us and to make us righteous before the Father because we can't do it. And on the third day, Christ was exalted in raising from the dead. And therefore, I don't think that it's a coincidence that the next thing that happens in our gospel lesson is that the people were bringing their children. They were bringing their infants and their babies. They were bringing toddlers to Jesus so that he would touch them and bless them. But right after Jesus teaches the disciples to humble themselves, what do they do? They do the exact opposite. They think Jesus doesn't have time for these kids. We don't have time for these kids. They exalt themselves above these kids and their parents, and they rebuke them. Now, I imagine they, they might have said something like this. Don't you know these little babies aren't even old enough to understand what they've received by being blessed by Jesus? They haven't even reached an age where they can come to him themselves. Now, that might not have been exactly what they said, but you get the idea. It's clear the disciples didn't think Jesus had time for these humble little babies. But Jesus would use this situation to continue teaching the disciples and us. He called the parents to himself and he says, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is just like we were talking about in Mark 10 in, in Sunday school, in adult Bible class. Jesus had a child in his arm. Imagine this. These children coming to him. He takes an infant child from his mother, maybe a child that was, that was just nursing, and he holds that child in his arms to say this to the disciples. Turning to the disciples, he teaches them and us what humbling yourself truly looks like. Children, who 
can do nothing for themselves but must trust in others for everything. To such as these belong the kingdom of God. It is what they receive in their baptism. Not because of anything that they can do. They're helpless. Because of what Christ has humbly done for them. In their baptism, Jesus wraps his loving arms around them and generously blesses them and makes them righteous before God and heaven. It's what you received in your baptism and what continues to happen to you, to each of us, through God's word and holy communion as each day we receive the kingdom of God humbly like a child. Not trusting in ourselves for our righteousness because we can't do it, but in Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we act more like the Pharisee or that upstanding gentleman from the beginning of the sermon, and we will, we humble ourselves not because we can humble ourselves, but because of the Holy Spirit that is within us helps us to humble ourselves and seek forgiveness, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I think that after that, what comes to mind is what we just sang. In our hearts we sing, Oh my Savior, help afford by your spirit and your word when my wayward heart would stray, keep me in the narrow way. Grace and time of need supply while I live and when I die. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite the congregation to please stand as we sing that today we can praise you, O oh God.
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and always ready to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy. Forgive us of those things of which our conscience is afraid. And give us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except by the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty Father, we come to you this day at the gracious invitation of your only Son. May we receive your gifts as little children, that no rebuke of our sinful flesh, the world or the devil, would deter us from turning to you in humility and repentance. Grant us that humility then to pray, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayer. prayer. As your son welcomed infants, give us a deep care for the children that are entrusted to us. We would defend their lives even before birth, and still in parents a desire and commitment to bring their little children to Jesus. Use our Sunday school, Bible classes, and youth confirmation to preserve them in the one true faith. Teach each of us in humility to receive the kingdom of God like a little child. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, you do not delight in wickedness or let the boastful stand before you. Give the leaders of the nations and our nation wisdom to govern in accordance with your good and gracious will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others that they may fulfill their duties with diligence and with humility. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of mercy, we praise you that you save our souls from death and our feet from falling. Care for those who are sick, hospitalized, and recovering, those who are near death. Preserve them from despair. Give them a confident hope in the resurrection promises of our risen Lord Christ. Come to the aid of everyone in their time of need. Especially this day, we include in our prayers Kelly, Helen, Tim, Donnie, Betty, Celia, Roger, Marlis, Ron, Shirley, Bev, Harold, Stephanie, Ken, Marcy, Jack, Conrad, Kim, Mel, Lori, and Marlene. Be with them, O Lord, and with all in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, our mighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all of our doings being ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome everyone this morning once again in the name of the Lord as we give thanks to God that the righteousness that God requires, that He demands of us, that's not something that we have to go and get. That's actually something that He actually gives to us in Jesus. When He takes away our sin and then actually gives us His righteousness. So we don't trust in our own righteousness. As Paul says, we don't have anything. We can lower the standards to try to find some. But Paul says, even the good things that they do are nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. And so the righteousness is something that God gives to us. And we're thankful for that. Because here's where we begin to realize that Christianity is not about making bad people good. 
It's not a movement from vice to virtue. Christianity is having the humility to understand that God came to make dead people alive. And if you're dead, you have absolutely nothing to give. Everything will be all gift that we receive by faith. Totally being dependent, like, as Jesus said today, a little child. And we give thanks to God here. He's given us that humility and that gift. A couple quick announcements here today. Uh, first of all, in your bulletin is a little insert here from our, our health ministry. And we're, we're looking at doing two things as a part of that group. Number one would be kind of a ride share uh, to and from church for a lot of our shut-ins who don't have the ability to drive. If that's something that you would like to do, would like to help out with that, let us know. And then also just calling on them, either on the phone or sending them a card or actually calling on them in person. If that's something you'd like to do, fill that out, turn that into the office or put it in the uh, nurse box there out in the hallway by the old vicar's office and uh, that's something we'll be uh, ready here to get up and get going here in the next couple of weeks. A couple of other announcements here today. We'll be heading in a moment here into the gym for our annual harvest dinner and then the fall uh, voters meeting. We'll have the budget for next year, election of boards and officers, and then voting on to receive a very precious gift that's actually coming from Germany and over in Europe, if uh, a congregation will vote to receive that gift, that's something we'll be talking about here as well today. And so we'll have a prayer before we head down here in a moment to eat, but uh, we invite you to head down there for that. Then also a quick rundown of the scheduler this week. We've got our adult confirmation class this Wednesday, 6.30, choir practices at 7. Philippians Bible study continues Thursday at 9 o'clock in the morning, and then our seasoned saints. Uh, we'll be heading over to participate in the Operation Quiet Comfort uh, this Saturday morning at 10 o'clock to pack all those stockings in the boxes for our military personnel. So if that's something you'd like to do, that's this Saturday and that's in the bulletin. Then also a reminder to schedule your time to get your picture taken for our new directory. We've got sign-up sheets out there. You can do it online. That's coming up here in a couple of weeks. And then as we get ready to close out October next week and celebrate Reformation, We'll be able to come here and have our Reformation Festival service, receive the sacrament. That also means November's coming when we start Christmas program practice here for the kids in a couple of weeks. And so we've got 10 kids now today. We've had kind of an outpouring here this morning. Uh, 10 kids that are signed up and ready to go here for the children's Christmas program. So a lot more kids, though, that we have in our congregation out there, though. So, But this is something we're putting the program together the next week or two. Please let us know so that we can kind of get your child or grandchild penciled in, because as I ultimately say, this is an incredible opportunity to give a great Christmas gift to somebody, especially for our older people. Uh, they'll always say, you know, that was my Christmas present, to see the kids up there in the costumes, singing the song, and everything else. It's the spiel I give to the kids every year before they march in here. You're, you're giving people the real Christmas gift and the real meaning for the season. So if that's something you'd like your child or grandchild to participate in, let us know. The program will be the Sunday before Christmas, December 18th. So before we close here today, we'll have a word of prayer so that as you leave, you can head in there and get started eating. And then that way we can kind of get things moving and then get ready here so we don't keep you all day, especially if you've got a football game that you want to go home and watch that we'll, we'll be able to eat here. And we thank the Board of Stewardship for that annual harvest dinner. It's always a wonderful meal to be able to have that again, where it was kind of postponed for a couple of years, to have that again. And then uh, we'll get started with the voters' meeting. So let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, for great is your faithfulness. And you are that faithful God who comes to us even when we are dead in our trespasses and sins. You made us alive to God in Christ. For as Martin Luther reminds us, we are nothing but beggars. And as we sing in the liturgy, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But we know that we can come here and here find those riches that we all need in Christ as he covers us up with his very own righteousness. Bless us, O Lord, that each and every day, as your children and as our congregation, here we would grow in our faith, hope, and trust in you and our love for one another. We ask your blessing our time of food and fellowship here today in our meeting that we would receive these gifts with a grateful and thankful heart for all things truly come from you 
as your mercy does truly endure forever. We ask your blessing upon us then in Jesus' name. In his name we pray. Amen. So have a good week here in the name of the Lord. We'll look forward to seeing you next Sunday as we celebrate the festival of the Reformation. And we'll conclude our worship today with our closing hymn, 684, Come unto me, ye weary.